Welcome, everybody, to another episode of JewishJourney.com, the podcast video show. We have with us Rabbi David Freed, who is a teacher. He's on the Jewish Studies faculty at the Hebrew High School of New England in West Hartford, Connecticut. One of the most famous things that he's known for is graduating from my alma mater, Yeshiva Chovei Torah. Woo! Go YCT! He graduated in 2013. Yes? Yes. Six and a half years ago. All right. From YCT. And he taught for years in Michigan. You were three years in Michigan? Three years in Michigan. So actually, in honor of your time in Michigan, I have a couple of Michigan IPAs that I brought for our session. I have a Spruce Tip IPA from North Peak Brewing Company and a New England IPA. Isn't that clever? It's a New England IPA, which is where you are, but from Michigan. So that's like super thematic. They were into their craft beers in Michigan. They do. Yeah, the whole Chicago, Michigan area, yeah, they love their beers up there. It gets really cold. you gotta, you got to stay warm somehow. So uh, thank you so much, Rabbi Fried, for joining us today. We're dealing with an abstruse topic today, which is one rabbinic text found in the Babylonian Talmud, which you actually pointed out to me. I'm sure I came across it at some point, but it's uh, rather curious, very fascinating. And do you want to introduce it? Like, how would you come across it? How did you decide... That this would be a really interesting topic for our conversation this evening. At some point, I had a chavrusa. We were learning the first parak of Ksubos, and we just came across this and said, this is absolutely hilarious. Uh, do you want to read it? I can read it. Oh. You want yeah. me to just read and translate the text? Yeah, so for everybody out there, this is in the Babylonian Talmud. It's in Ketubo 8b. And it's, uh, we're, we're going to be discussing a Baraita, a Tanaitic, an early rabbinic text that is non, not part of the Mishnah, but still sometime probably second or third century of the, uh, well, finished by basically 200. So basically the, the second century of the common era, probably. Right. So, it it starts, so it might be Ula, who's a third generation of Mora, or it might be a Baraita. We're not sure. He's roughly mid to late third century. Something like that. Yeah. Maybe later third century, but no later than him. Yeah. So he says, Asara Koso Tiknu Chachamim Bevet Avel. So the the Chachamim, the sages, instituted that we should drink ten cups of wine in a Beit Avel, in the Shiva house. Three before the meal in order to open up your intestines, three during the meal in order to soak the food in your belly, and four after the meal, so uh, in those days it was common, you would, you know, have a cup of wine with benching, but in the in the Shiva house, they said, have four cups of wine with benching. Benching has four brachot in it. Those are the four things we just mentioned. Hazan and Birkata Aretz and Bonei Yerushalayim and Tova Metiv. So have a separate cup of wine for each of those four brachot of benching. That brings us to a total of ten cups of wine in the Shiva house. Hosifu Aleham Arba. And then they added another four. Echad Keneged Chazanei Ha'ir. One to honor the... Uh, Chazan probably doesn't mean cantors here. Um, uh, probably, uh, probably is uh, Chazan is like is more like today what we think of the rabbis of the community. Ve'echad connected parnasse ha'ir and one to honor the 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 machers, the you know the people with all the money in the community. Ve'echad connected what the benefactors. benefactors. That's ve'echad connected beit hamikdash. You know, our, our 13th cup of wine is to honor the Beit HaMikdash. Ve'echad k'neged Rabban Gamliel. And while we're at it, 14th cup of wine for Rabban Gamliel. Hitchilu hayu shotin u'mishtakrin. He says, 14 cups of wine. We had a problem. People were getting drunk. Ech ziru ha'davra liyoshna. So they went back to just 10. Because 14 was too much. People were getting drunk on 14. They said, okay, only 10 cups of wine. And that's, that's the end of the right. That's tough. reasonable. Yes. That, just 10 is reasonable. One thing that I know that I pointed out to you when you first sent this text to me was, and I, and I think when people first encounter this text, the thing that shocks them is, why are you drinking at a morning house? That doesn't seem to be, right? The first right, thing, I mean, one, it doesn't right, seem to be the obvious activity. 
you're allowed to have wine in Shiva, but you know, it's not right, it's not what we normally think of as the environment of a Shiva house, right? We think of a Shiva house of this somber place of mourning. We're talking about our memories of the deceased. You know, we're not we you don't think of it, you don't think of it as a place, you know, in, in our contemporary experience of it where you're sitting down and having 10 cups of wine. One thing I, that's a little bit unclear to me is, is this all one person drinking or is this, there are 10 cups out there. It's just different people maybe drinking or drinking from them, right? That, that's a little ambiguous. So it, it, it is, yeah, it is a little bit ambiguous in the text of the Gemara itself. I looked up the way the Rambam quotes it and the Rambam makes it quite clear he's assuming 10 cups of wine per person. Right. So in the Mishnah Torah there in, in morning, 13.8, he says, well, it's funny because he limits it. He says, yeah. shotim there's no drinking in the Beit Avel more than Yetar right. 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 no. right. Everybody can have up to 10 month. cups. You just can't drink outside of those 10 or more than 10. Yeah. Right, he's big, and I think it's it's implicit in the Gemara also probably that it's the same person because of the last line about they were getting too drunk. That if this was ten cups, you know, if this was sorry, fourteen cups that was split between multiple people, people wouldn't have been getting too drunk. The implication is each individual was having all this; they were getting too drunk, so they said back to ten. Right, and that's why the Rambam says you're not allowed to drink more than ten cups of wine in the Beit Avel because you'll get too drunk. Yeah, that's really interesting. How you know what people's tolerance was. You know, or, or right. also, what does it say about how diluted the wine was? Right. I was so thinking that, that like, as well. Ten, we have to... Ten, ten you know, with food is something that's manageable, and you're going to be feeling good, but 14, that's too far. That's the, I mean, you know, the fence that will break the camera right. Their wine was, their wine, they diluted it three parts water to one part wine. So it was one-fourth the strength of what we would think of as, you know, a strong wine. I don't yet know exactly how this works the strength of the wine or whatever but if we were to say one quarter like you just mentioned so it'd be like having several drinks like two yeah or three. 10 cups of wine would be like two and a half cups of our wine popped out to me is in is the phrase bait me in the mission and just after which i'm hoping to discuss at a later episode and bait me okay. appears five times five times in the Mishnah, ten times in the Tosefta, and most of the times that it occurs in both the Mishnah, like I think three out of the five, and the Tosefta, like six or seven out of the ten, it's paired up and partnered with Beit Avel. Now I haven't fully studied Beit Avel in the Mishnah and Tosefta, but I I don't think it's an accident, and I don't think it's a merely a literary thing that. Beit Avel and Beit Mishta are paired up together in the mission in well, Tosefta. It's, it's, it's echoing, it's, that's echoing the Pasuk in Kohela, Tov Lachad al Beit Avel, Milachad al Beit Mishta. There are three times in Tanakh that Beit Mishta appears, and one of them is in the seventh parak of Kohelas. And so it could, I, I think, I mean, look, the rabbis were definitely aware of that, that Pasuk in Kohelas, and I think that could have affected their their twinning of Beit Avel and Beit Mishta in the mission in Tosefta. However, I think there's something more going on, which I still okay. have to work out, uh, which is they're very, 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 very similar. The uh, Just as a Beit Avel is not something that's always designated as a Beit Avel, it just happens to be where the mourner's living, right? And that's just where they are. And I think that's the same thing with a Beit Mishta, which is that it's not like it's a pub. I don't think a Beit Mishta is a pub. Like... If this is a designated drinking place, I think it's, hey, this it's at, you know, Yoshua's house tonight, or it's at Eliezer's house tonight. Right. It's, where it's, we're it's, a, it's a party that has some that has some drinking there. It's where drinking is taking place. A okay. baby is where drinking is taking place, and that's the focus of the evening. There might be talking involved, and who knows, maybe some snacks. They're, they're, they brought their wine, they're drinking. We can have a separate conversation about Beit Mishta and the mission in Tosefta, but let's just... Are you disagreeing with me? Well, I'm thinking, and uh, maybe I'm reading it through Rashi's eyes, which maybe isn't shot, but I'm thinking of, you know, the first mission in Brachot that talks about that, you know, it talks about Rabbi Gamliel's sons coming home from the Beit Mishteh, and Rashi says, a wedding. Yep. They were out drinking late in the night, and um, they, they went to a wine party. They were out drinking. They come back home. Their father's not happy with them. And they said, sorry, we lost the chance to say Shema. He's like, nope, you can still say it. Um, 
and that's totally separate conversation also about um you know how many how you know how often is it that you're like you're out late but you weren't drinking <laughs> like i love that in the first mission like we're out at a drinking party and like <laughs> obviously we're coming back after midnight <laughs> That'll be a separate conversation when I get to the Beit Mishta episode. If you want to be my, you know, interlocutor, that'd be great. Um, in any event, so, but there's a, there's a, there's a pairing here between Beit Mishta and Beit Ava, at least in the Mishnah of the Sefta, which is also Tanaitic literature. And I think it could partially be literary uh, based off of Sefer Kohelis and Ecclesiastes, but I think also it's really that it just happens to be someone's house and something's going on. Um, and it brings me to to Sefta Bava Basra in six four, where it says Hayahalech Leveta Avel Uleveta Mishta. If someone was just happening to walk to a morning house or to a wine drinking house, Hayabiado Lagin Shel Yain Hamit Kash Kash Lo Yimelenu Mayim Mipnei Shetunu Taanas Chinam Bimaya Chaver Ir Harizim Mutar. Okay, so basically. There's an instance where you would happen to be carrying wine, obviously to a Beit Mishta, because that, that's to be expected. You're going to be drinking wine, but also to a Beit Avel, that someone would be drinking, that someone would be bringing wine over to a mourner's house. And so that that text reminded me when when you first brought this text in Ketubot A B to me, I'm like, oh, there's this other text about a Beit Avel that someone would be, you know, not all right. the wine is already supplied there. It could be. Someone's bringing wine to the party, or right. the morning. The, the the pairing between them is a lot more. Yeah, I think it's a lot more interesting. Like at first, it's just sort of a contrast: very happy place, very sad place. But when you think that, yeah, these are actually both places that, in their times, involved a large amount of drinking, it's an even more interesting pairing. I think it also that the 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 Gemara in Bracho that I you know that I mentioned when we were when we were talking earlier. That talks about Yesho Teo Vitovlo, Yesho Teo Viralo, that there are there are some people who drink wine and it's a good thing, and there are some people who drink wine and it's a bad thing. Uh, and then for for the people who drink wine and it's a good thing, you know, it quotes the Pasak Yai in this Enosh, you know, drinking, you know, in a happy setting, that that it seems to be understood as a good thing. Uh, and then it quotes the Pasak in Mishle, it's Nushe Harlo Vevi Yain Lamari Nefesh, give strong drink to one who is lost and blind to the bitter of to the bitter of spirit, um, and that's their example of drinking that's bad for you. That like you shouldn't you should drink when you're happy, not when you're sad. And yet we have, and that seems to very much contrast with it, you know with our approach in the Gemara in in Ketubot here, which suggests no, it's actually a good thing to to give people who are sad and in mourning some wine to comfort them. I tend to think that that piece in Brachot is kind of an exception. I, I don't, I, I like, as you pointed out to me, so this verse in, in Mishle in Proverbs 31, 6, the give, so one thing I, 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 I mentioned, or I mentioned to you before this, but, um, which is that the, the verse in Proverbs is two-pronged and it reflects each other. So you have Shekhar that you're giving to someone who is hapless to the Ovid and then wine to the bitter of spirit. So quickly, really, really quickly, which is you give the bitter drink, not to the bitter person, but to the but you give wine to the bitter person and the bitter drink to the other person, which I think is really cool. But um, so there are five appearance. There are several appearances of this pasuk throughout throughout uh, throughout uh, the Bavli, throughout the Babylonian Talmud. And one of them is in Erevin 65a, which is that Rabbi Hanin says wine was created only in order to comfort mourners and to reward the wicked. Quoting this Proverbs piece, so I think it's not that wine is that even from this verse in rabbinic literature that it's being maligned i think that there's even here right that there's it, a point it, in yes. that wine that wine has an important role in mourning for the rabbis right i i think right i think there are two different approaches within within chazal to how to understand this verse and rashi i mean our argumar in, in ketubot does not quote this verse rashi brings it in on our and probably Rashi is getting it from you know, the Gemara that you just referenced in in Erevin that assumes that this is actually uh, encouraging wine having a positive role in Nichum Avelim. But I think there's there's definitely a contrast there between that and you know how it's 
portrayed in the Gemara and Brachot. You may be right. You know, I haven't done a thorough survey. Maybe the one in Brachot is the exception, and the rule is that yes, we have a positive attitude towards towards wine for for comforting mourners. Um, but it, it it's still whichever one is the majority and whichever one is the minority. It's still interesting to see those two those two different approaches emerge. We have of the ten, the first six are actually really reasonable. We have three prior to the meal, so that's. That's not uncommon. People might have cocktails. They might have drinks prior to a meal. And then three during the meal, again, you know, you're know, you eating a lot, whether you're having pre-meal snacks, appetizers, and then during the meal, you're eating a lot. So it's being absorbed, right? And, and each of the three, you know, the first three, they, they open up one's appetite and the, you know, you have the during the meal, so it's helping soak it up or whatever. The four that are post-meal are the really fascinating ones that come out of nowhere of one each for each of the blessings of the Birchat Amazon. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? My thoughts on that is, you know, we have the idea of, you know, saying a bracha over a cup of wine. We have lots of instances of that. And of course, it was commonplace that you would bench over a cup of wine. But yeah, I mean, it certainly was not commonplace that you'd have a separate cup of wine for each bracha of benching. And it certainly seems like at this point, they're looking for excuses to add more cups of wine. I think that becomes even more clear when you get to the the next four, the ones that they ultimately got rid of. It just, it really feels like, you know, what can we drink to? You know, what's, well, th- this one's for the rabbis, and this one's, you know, and this one's for the benefactors, and this one's for the Besa Mikdash, and this one's for Robin Gamliel. <laughs> we're, we're drinking, let's just keep drinking. <laughs> what else Good. can we drink to? Right. I will say before we get, I definitely want to talk about the the four additional to get us up to 14, but the ones from 7 through 10, I'm really fascinated because it's not clear when one drinks those, because it could be that you drink them after you say all four blessings, or like Rashi said, suggests, maybe it's after each and every bracha, you are, you're blessing on them. Right. So I mean, you, that say, you say the first bracha, you drink, you get the next one ready. Say the second blessing, you drink, get the next one ready, and so on. Right. Or it's you just kind of a weird sort of benching to interrupt benching in the middle to make a break for your goffin. Right. Uh, it's, that's why it's strange to me, Rashi's suggestion of that. And yet it makes sense in the context of the Gemara also, because whoever heard of switching cups in the middle of benching and then drinking them all afterwards, like that doesn't really make a lot of sense either. The, right? The whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, <laughs> right, right. Benching is four bracho, but we think of it as one unit. That's true, but they are still technically four separate bracho. Right. I wonder, like, and I guess this, it's kind of far afield from the from the drinking question. But if they really are four separate bracho, and you know, it's not a hefsake to say break break golf, and in between them, like, okay, well, how much of a hefsake can you have? between the brachot of Birkat HaMazon. Can I, you know, stop and do something and have a conversation and continue with the next bracha? Right. I mean, from this brisa, it would seem that they're treating each of the, the brachot as being independent blessings, not being independent on the previous one. Yeah. I mean, it does sound that way from here. It just doesn't really sound or, that way from anywhere else. Or... or you could maybe suggest that the wine drinking, the each having, having a different cup between the blessings, is not does not constitute a half sake. Maybe it's just part of the flow of the Birchat Amazon. You have the cups of wine in between the blessings, and that's all in it's, it's all a package deal. Yeah, it, it could be right. It could be that this is just this is just the Birchat Amazon that they instituted. In, in, in the base avel, you know, even though normally you'd say it straight through to the end and then make your bravery of in the base avel, they institute you make a bravery of after each bracha. And it's just, and it doesn't really have any broader implications on, you know, what kind of interruptions you could have between bracha and benching. All right. So uh, those 10 are good. It's funny also, by the way, you have your first six and you're probably feeling good. You've had a lot of food. I just, it's so funny, this, the cup seven through 10 are in such rapid succession and without any food between any of them. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be like really impactful, like just so much wine without any food all in quick succession. That's, that's got to be really impactful. Right. I mean, of course, again, 
with the amount that they diluted their wine, four cups of wine for them is like one cup for us. So it's like, you know, it's like downing a cup of wine very quickly. Yes. And, and that's only if we're assuming that it was a quarter strength of what we're used to drinking. I mean, it can't be much more than that. I mean, our standard wine is what, 12, 13%. I think yeah. the strongest wine you can make just by fermenting grapes is maybe 18%. So, you know, before distillation was invented, you can't get much more than that. So, you know, if I mean, you think- who knows? Maybe they have like five to 10% wines, just like we see with like the Rashi wines or the other, we see wines right. that, have, that I mean, like the so Moscato, like, you know, like a Moscato. You could totally right. go through like, like several Moscato. cups of Moscato. It's for sure not stronger than Moscato. You know, it's really funny because in the Brisa, it says Hosifo Alehem Arba. Like, lit. like somehow those 10 were good, just not enough. Like, what was it that they, that they found to be deficient about those 10 that they needed to add not one or two, but four? It's just amusing to me. Uh, do you have any thoughts on these four? I, I really do don't i mean other than what i said already that it just at this point it just feels like they're looking for you know what can we raise a glass to yeah 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 it does feel like this this was good but we're not giving sufficient hoda we're not you know not enough hakarza to we really need to recognize so much good out there the people who helped make this happen the people financially making it happen and also we're sad about this person dying, but we have the national tragedy of the destruction of the of our of our uh, you know Beit Hamikdash, our sanctification house. That's a horrible tragedy that we're still mourning over. And also, Rabban Gamliel, he was really great. He helped you know restart our nation after the fall of Beit Hamikdash. So let's let's do this. And you know, it's I mean, I think really, if I had to say, it's really about. Even the, the Beit HaMikdash thing, that's a mourning piece. But the other three, I think, are about really about acknowledging. And it, right? It's about acknowledgement. Hakar Zatov, like you're. Right. I mean, certainly, right. If you, look at, if you look at what Rashi fills in, right? Sort of, when you first read it, it just feels really random. It's like, yeah. this one's for this group. And it, like, it really just feels like looking for things to drink to. But yeah, Rashi, Rashi makes you know, fills it in and, and, you know, makes each one somehow connected to Avel, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the Chazanim help us arrange the funerals and the, you know, and, and the benefactors help pay for the funerals if we can't afford it. And Rabban Gamliel, well, the Gemara itself fills that in afterwards with, you know, Rabban Gamliel we're very appreciative to because he decreed, you know, no fancy coffins and considerably lowered the cost of funerals. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, those all tie in well together, certainly from what we get from Rashi's comments and noting. I think that definitely helps, and it, and it makes sense. But um, as we eventually see, though, Hitchilo Hayushotim with Shakrim, you know, they once we they added those four on, people were just getting drunk every time in a Beit Avel, right? And that just wasn't. And it, that points more to fourteen. I mean. It could be 14 cups for each and every person present, but even if they had 14 heavy cups, I mean, no matter how you divide them, that's still a lot of alcohol. <laughs> it, could, it could go that way. But definitely either way, people were getting drunk trying to get these extra four in, and then they hechsiru uh, hadavar liyoshna, that they needed to go back to the tent, just ten. Right. And I think that, you know, I, I think that fits in with a rabbinic attitude towards drinking in general of, you know, we're not puritanical about it. You know, we think drinking yeah. has a positive role in human experience, but drunkenness we're not in favor of. I'm sure you'll talk about Purim and, you know, is that an exception in some other episode? But putting that aside, generally, we're not in favor of drunkenness. I'm not sure yet. That's the honest truth. Like, I need to research more. I, you know, it's funny because I, stay tuned viewers, I'm going to be doing episodes, I'm sure in the future after my research on drunkenness in rabbinic literature, um, but I'm not clear yet on the rabbinic attitudes in Donahedic literature on drunkenness, but I'll, I'm, I'm excited for it. By the way, speaking of drunkenness, there is one text I do want to mention, which is neither, it's not really clear whether drunkenness is good or bad, or, you know, if it has a negative moral valence in Arabin, 
And that sugi over there talks about, there's a brisa, which says if you're drunk, you're pater from tefillah, you're exempt from prayer, which um, doesn't necessarily make it, it's not clear whether that's good or bad. If you're drunk, you're exempt from tefillah, just like other people can be exempt from tefillah. I, yeah, I wouldn't have used the word exempt, right? You're not, Utter. you're not allowed. It would be improper for you to pray while drunk. It doesn't mean like, it doesn't mean you're exempt. It means you need to wait till you're no longer drunk and then pray. How do you translate Potter? Again, I guess I'm, again, I'm reading Gemara through the prism of Rishonim again. Uh, but, <laughs> right, the Rambam doesn't say Potter. The Rambam just says Al Yit Palel. I'll send you a post of mine, and for viewers, I'll drop a link in the description below, but I'll send you something I wrote back in the spring about that. Either way, whatever it is, the getting drunk in this situation is definitely not what the what they intended. Right. We, we can, I think everybody, that that's clear. It's like, uh, maybe this wasn't effective, but having just those four cups getting to drunkenness, yet taking those away, sticking with 10... They're not crossing that drunken threshold yet. They're probably getting nicely buzzed. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and it could, of course, go back to the pasuk and Mishle of because the very next verse talks about helping people forget of whatever their stresses or troubles are, which is an interesting connection as to like I'm trying to think of like what the motivation is because they don't specify. They don't spell out why should there be cups of wine and why should there. Why should there be so many for this specific, this particular instance, this occasion? Right, Rashi, right, Rashi fills that in. But you're right, the Gemara itself doesn't doesn't give you any indication why we're doing this. Oh, I mean, right. Rashi says Laharbo lo vishtia, and then he quotes the the, the Proverbs line. Right. So to increase, to increase. Post- but actually, by the way, it's actually fascinating his use of pronoun Laharbo lo vishtia to increase for him of drinking for the mourner right i wonder right is it really for every person there or is it really just the mourner who's supposed to drink right because the more the people visiting the mourner or the mourners are i mean they're not dealing with this issue as much as the mourner or the mourners are and maybe it's these cups are um these cups are meant for really just those in mourning and, at least, at least according to this comment of Rashi. Right, right. It's funny, I was at a shiva house once, not, not a religious family, and the, the man who was sitting shiva wanted to like pour drinks for everyone. That was something he, he, like, he really enjoyed bartending. It was something he really, so everyone who came in, he'd ask what drink he could get for you, and I thought this was really, really odd. Certainly not something I'd seen in an orthodox shiva house. Um, and that was before I had learned the skimar, and after learning this, like, Maybe he was more in the rabbinic spirit of what Shiva was supposed to look like than the Orthodox homes are. Yeah. And there's no technical prohibition in halakha against a mourner drinking. No, not at all. Clearly, there's a Gemara precedent and in Rambam that a mourner can drink. Yeah. Here. I don't know that it appears at all in the Shulchan Aruch, but at least in the Gemara and Rambam it appears. Yeah. As far as I know, uh, it's not in the Shulchan Aruch. I could be wrong. Right. Yeah, I guess not. I mean, the Mishpat doesn't doesn't reference it, which sounds like it, you know, the image part usually finds it if it's in Shulchan Aruch, but it's a good question. I don't know why Shulchan Aruch left it out. Yeah, it's a good question. What's bothering the Shulchan Aruch? <laughs> Rabbi David Fried, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Jewish Drinking, and uh, L'chaim. L'chaim, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely.